Hello, and welcome to the Catholic Mama Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Mooney Flynn. <laughs> Thanks for joining me as my husband bobs his head along with my little musically inclined intro. It has a rhythm to it. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's bopping, be bopping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so my husband's here with me, Pat. I am back again on the Catholic Mama podcast. <laughs> Your favorite podcast. <laughs> I, I, I mean it. <laughs> I really do. Uh, is this segment called Patechism? We're going to do the Patechism. <laughs> <laughs> I wish my, my name doesn't lend itself to anything fun like that. No, it doesn't. Pat, Pat is versatile. Mm -hmm. Flynn is pretty versatile. We've noticed that because our friend Alex has come up with all sorts of names. The Flincident, Flinduism, <laughs> Flincinati. Die hard with the flingents. That's right. Yeah. He just, he literally, so our friend Alex, not like this is of interest to anybody, but you're getting it anyways, free of charge. He literally just takes the time to open up Notepad in his iPhone and come up with puns about our last name, Flynn. And he's got like a list of like 47 of it's these. It's a lot. Yeah. It's, it's and he sends me, he sends me the, the new ongoing. updates. Yeah. <laughs> he's so good at puns though. I mean, and they come up quick. Because he just sits there and thinks about them. Well, the not time. just uh, yeah, not just our name, but uh, he really does. I he mean, is. He's quick with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's his passion. But anyways, <laughs> he, so I, I I came up with Patechism, but he he got us very nicely. He got us a coffee table book of the Vatican, and he suggested that we should call our house the Patican. <laughs> so that's where we live. <laughs> the Patican. We live in the Patican. Oh, okay. So I did. Uh, I. <laughs> I did a podcast episode with um, Jenny Shaw from the uh, Barefoot, a oh shoot, Barefoot Abbey. I can't think, and now I'm totally blanking on it. Sorry, Jenny. <laughs> but she uh, she was talking about how she named she they named their property. I yeah. said it back in that episode. I think it was in the spring. Oh, we should name ours. I didn't know ours were, was already named the Patican. Well, well, now you do. Wow, that you sounds great. You learn something new every day. We live in the Patican. <laughs> But anyways, yeah, the, the Patechism is just our <laughs> idea to just have a study with your husband, Pat, of the Catholic Catechism. Yeah, so I go through the Catechism on my Catechism Fridays, my very um, brilliantly named segment, 10-minute mm -hmm. segment, which actually you came up with. I did. Uh, and that's a just quick hitters. We are currently far, far beyond what we're going to be talking about today. Mm -hmm. And I just finished up. We're, we're talking about the last couple lines in the the, cate uh, the the Nicene Creed. Yeah. So way beyond what we're going to talk about. Yep. But if you want those quick hitting, 10 minute, uh, little bite sized bits of <laughs> the catechism, then you can hit up my Friday episodes. Yeah. But this, I think, is going to be fun because uh, we'll get to actually spend some more time. I and, and also, you know, not even just read aloud, which is what I do mostly yes. in those 10-minute episodes. We get to jam on this a bit. Yeah, so let's start with basics. Why study the catechism? Why read the catechism? Um, well, because it is really a summary of church teaching. And as, as Catholics, so let's back up because there might be some people who aren't Catholic listening, and I definitely want to invite everyone to um, to join us in this, especially if it becomes an ongoing series. Um, and just be very clear about what the Catholic paradigm is. Uh, the Catholic paradigm is that God left us with a church and that he guides and protects his church, uh, especially when it comes to the, the, um, its guardianship of the deposit of faith and promulgating the faith. So when Jesus ascended, he didn't, he didn't leave us with scripture. He left us with a church, a visible, hierarchical, unified church. And it's because that church and the authority that God gives to his church and the protection that God affords to his church, that we actually can have confidence in scripture and specifically the canon of scripture of what books actually belong in the Bible and which ones didn't quite make the cut. This, of course, was a matter of, you know, uh, controversy both historically and is still now. Uh, Catholic Bibles are, uh, are bigger than Protestant Bibles. And uh, I'm convinced that the only way you can get around this dilemma of of knowing, you know, what should be included in Scripture is you need some type of authority. Uh, and that is, of course, the mechanism that God gave us. He gave us the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church really is uh, the body of Christ. And the Catechism, um, in fact, I think a wonderful summary of the Catechism could be found in the Catechism. So why don't I just, why don't I just read that and we yeah, can talk about there. it. So this is, um, this is actually um, in the... Um, what, sec what section is this? Um, it's not even a paragraph yet. No, so it's not. This is the. This is like the preface from uh, Pope John Paul II. 
Yeah, so real quick, just, yes, yeah, so this is at the very, very beginning of the catechism. I mean, we're looking, this is a printed version. This is like page four and five. As you get into the catechism, it's separated into these very neat, um, easy to read, bite sized paragraphs. And then uh, that each paragraph has a number associated with it. So uh, we're not at that point yet, but go ahead. Yeah, so if you want to follow along, we are on page... We'll, you know, we'll link to the catechism we have in the show notes if we make yeah. this a series. Uh, but we are on page uh, four under the section Arrangement and Material. Don't worry, but this will be short. But this is, I think, a wonderful summary of what the catechism is and what it should do. So um, Pope John Paul II... St. John Paul II writes, A catechism should faithfully and systematically present the teachings of sacred scripture, the living tradition in the church, and the authentic magisterium, as well as the spiritual heritage of the fathers, doctors, and saints of the church to allow for a better knowledge of the Christian mystery and for enlivening the faith of the people of God. It should take into account the doctrinal statements which down the centuries the Holy Spirit has intimated to his church. It should also help to illumine with the light of faith, the new situations and problems which had not yet emerged in the past. So that is what a catechism is for. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's interesting to note that prior to the official Catholic catechism uh, being published and distributed, uh, I think the Council of Trent, actually, it started with the Council of Trent of, of compiling the first Catholic catechism, a universal one, That's because right. prior to that it was just you know individual orders would try to put together their own catechism. Had, and he had local catechisms. He had right. local catechisms, mm -hmm. but then in response to the Protestant Reformation, the, the Catholic Church realizes that they needed a, you know, a body of work that would summarize, uh, dive into, um, and, uh, and interpret. And un in interpret, unpack, and yeah. apply, apply the yep. teachings of, of the faith. So mm -hmm. that's where the, the history of the catechism is, is, comes from, from that. And we've had a few different versions of the catechism over time, maybe different formats. Like the Baltimore catechism is in a different format than what we have today. Yep. Uh, the one t I mean, they're, they're all great. Like we, we've, did a, we've done a couple episodes where we looked back at the Council of Trent catechism, right. that the initial catechism, one, the Roman yeah. catechism. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's great to read it. And it's also very interesting just to see, you know, the, the, truth, the truths never change. Right. But the way it's written about, you, it, it's it's fascinating to read any of the uh, the catechism. It is, and and even go back to what people argue is like the original original catechism, the Didache, and you'll see the same essential truths proclaimed. Now, the faith has developed over the years, and this is you know one of John Henry Newman's famous um, contributions is the development of doctrine. Right, that we had everything, um, you know, Christ gave us everything, uh, uh, you know, when he when he you know revealed God's truth to us. But we come to better understand it over time. We come to better learn how to apply the consequences of it over time. That's the development of doctrine. That's the idea there. Uh, so, for example, a, a classic example development of doctrine would be the Trinity itself, right? The, Trini the word of the Trinity is nowhere found in Scripture, but it's something pretty much all Christians are committed to. And a lot of the doctrine of the Trinity is worked out by the Cappadocian Fathers, and we'll see many quotes of them here in, in the Catechism. Um, and it's just saying, well, here's what we're committed to in, in Scripture, right? Um, Christ is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet we're committed to monotheism, right? So, so let's, let's, let's formalize this. Let's really figure this out, right? And that's, and that's good theology as well, is, you know, here's our, here are our givens. Here's our starting points. Now let's be rigorous about this. What are the consequences of this? So, yeah, you'll never find the word the Trinity in scripture yet it's something that you know really i mean that's something that many christians consider the breaking point right You're like what makes you a christian uh and i'm hesitant to draw two strong claims here because there are of course like mormons uh or jehovah's witness that deny the trinity they still want to say that that they're christian but even other protestants say no unless you're trinitarian you're not christian now something that can resolve all this issue uh, of course, is just to remove yourself from the Protestant paradigm entirely and say, well, look, God God didn't want us to go by the Bible alone. He gave us a church. So right. th As he ascended, he didn't say, guys, read my Bible. Yeah, <laughs> check out my book um, and, you know, figure it out from there. I mean, that's that, that paradigm is just so ridiculous because now we have, you know, um, I mean, just, just look at the divisions in Christianity of people who are all saying, look, I have the right interpretation of this book. You have it wrong. Why would God ever want to leave us so completely confused? And the answer is he didn't. 
He gave us a church that was meant to guide us in these essential truths. And if, and if matters of, of serious debate come up, we can have a formal declaration from the authority of the church, the magisterium of the church, to settle these debates um, so, so as to avoid uh, schism or, or heresy. And that's what we've had uh, down throughout the centuries, uh, through, through the councils, um, even just certain papal decrees, uh, you name it. So the church is a source of security and knowledge. Um, but yeah, that, so the Trinity, uh, getting far ahead of ourselves here, is just a, a very classic example of something that even many Protestants are committed to, but you don't find that in Scripture, right? So uh, how do we get it? Well, we get it through the idea of the development of doctrine and the authority and the teachings of the church, right? The church uh, boldly teaches and affirms the triune God. So, yeah. yeah. Well, even, um, you know, what was it? today is the feast day of the Assumption of Mary. Uh, mm-hmm. What That wasn't declared as dogma until 1950, correct? Yeah, around the 50s. So very, I think that's probably the last recent. one, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, now, is it true, and I don't want to go off topic, but a lot of the times when we start seeing definitions uh, coming up, say, about the life of Mary in particular, it's only because those things started to become a, a be, be attacked, Right, and then the church had to responded and put it in writing what everybody already knew in yeah, the first place. There's a saying that dogma is often not defined until it's until it's attacked, until people start denying it. It's often not defined until it's denied, right? Because for, for so long these things were just it was just it was just a given. Like I mean, you look through most of Christian history, things like the Eucharist, like the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist were just such a given. These, this wasn't something that people questioned until of course, you know, sort of after um, after Luther, after the Reformation. So then, you know, there's, there, because of certain tensions and debates that arise that weren't previously issues, the church does need to come down and say, no, we are formally declaring this, we are formally defining this, and then they can elevate it to a certain level of authority, dogma being the highest. So dogma is, all, is absolutely binding on all Catholics on the pain of heresy. You have to accept dogmas. This is the highest level of authoritative teaching in the church. Um, so that is that is the case for some of the teachings. Other times, it, the church just might feel that it's fruitful to uh, make a teaching more uh, authoritative, more defined. So I don't want to say that it's always because it's attacked, but it's that is often a time. But people shouldn't think that just because um, something is defined at a certain time that it was invented at that time. Yeah. That is not true. That is not true. And you will find that even dogmas that weren't defined until much, much, much later, even relevant recent history, they go all the way back in the tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Marian dogmas are good examples of that. Mm -hmm. So if you want a crash course in church history and the study of Catholic theology, well, you got the catechism. You got it right here. Just read all 1,200 pages? Is that what it is? Yeah. Oh, no, not even. It's a real page turner, though. And the great thing about the catechism is you're going to be getting so much scripture, um, and not just scripture. You'll get, of course, the scriptural references, uh, passages, quotations. Uh, The catechism is filled with footnotes. So if you followed all the footnotes, you'll, I mean, you'll... You'll it's be, a lifetime of reading. Yeah, it's a lifetime yeah. of studying. Yeah, for real sure. quick, I, I want to say our friend Carlo Broussard of Catholic Answers, he mentioned on a podcast that I did with him recently, and I love this, and I want to repeat it because I've already repeated it once. I'm going to say it again. He loves taking a bit of the catechism, a paragraph or two, and praying on it. Mm. So, you know, we often do that with scripture. Catechism is a great one, too. So he uses this as a prayer companion, which I really love that idea. Yeah, and you'll not only get um, scripture by studying through the catechism, uh, which we'll, I'm sure, get a couple examples of this as we move forward. Um, but you'll also get incredible references to papal encyclicals and early uh, church and fathers, church fathers yep. and church doctors and saints. So it's just, it's so rich. Which is a really it's good so point, rich. because if, mm-hmm. if you look at all the church doctors and all the encyclicals and all the writings of the saints, to, to pick one out of there is very difficult, I think. It's almost like you know paralysis by analysis. You're like, oh, which one do I choose? I think this is a great entry point, right? So maybe you're reading something and you look. You know, the footnotes are great. Never skip the footnotes. So you're looking through the footnotes and maybe something catches your eye. Use the catechism as a a, a jumping off point for a further study yeah, as well. Absolutely. Well, shall we dive in? Yeah, let's do it. Should we start at the prologue or just go to part one? Probably part one. Yeah. Yeah, the prologue's very good. Read the prologue, everybody. That's your homework. Yeah, Do you know, that. and never, yeah, you know, never, never skip acknowledgments or prologues or forewords. They're all really interesting. Yeah, as we skip, pr- as the we prologue, skip, yeah. <laughs> well, we haven't skipped good. it. We've read yeah. it. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have a nicer reading voice than I do. Why don't even with the sniffly why, nose? Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and and read? Which, and what am I reading? We'll, I believe just read paragraph twenty six. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and okay. start us off, and then we'll stop and discuss. Sure. Okay. So this is part one: the profession of faith, section one. I believe. We believe. Paragraph twenty six. We begin our profession of faith by saying, "I believe" or "We believe." Before expounding the church's faith as confessed in the creed, celebrated in the liturgy, and lived in observance of God's commandments and in prayer, we must first ask what to believe means. Faith is man's response to God, who reveals himself and gives himself to man, at the same time bringing man a super abundant light as he searches for, for the ultimate meaning of his life. Thus we shall consider first that search, then the divine revelation by which God comes to meet man, and finally the response of faith. And so that's saying that there's a chapter one, two, and three that the catechism is promising to get to. So I think that's really interesting, right? What they really don't, you think, you know, I believe in God the Father Almighty. That seems like, oh, okay, all right, I get that. Yeah. But wow, we're really starting with I believe. What does it mean to believe? They really do not leave questions. Right. I love that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we know, I mean, how many people have written entire tomes just on the creed, right? There's so much content there. And, oh, and yes, as the entire faith, And in right? fact, the catechism goes through the creed. <laughs> so what we're, we're doing we're, now. We're going to be doing ones. it. We're going to be go doing it here. So, I mean, the creed, those early, um, I mean, that that is really, uh, you know, it's it, in some ways it's a mnemonic device, right? So remember the, the faith had to be passed down in a time before people had the, the, the printing press before people, uh, most people were literate. Um, so that's why even in scripture, you see at times when, when St. Paul is, is um, referencing some things, his style will change at times into, into, into a certain form or structure. And the reason you'll, you'll see that is because he's sometimes um, using one of these mnemonic devices and just passing on something that was passed on to him. And he'll say that, I'm passing this on to you as it was passed on to me. So you can kind of catch those, those structures when they're being used. So that's just kind of an interesting historical context. Now, you also had people um, uh, who were very much trained in, in incredible feats of memorization um, uh, when it came to memorizing uh, the Torah and stuff like that as well, uh, which is a very much a lost art in the in these days. Yeah, you know, I should go back uh, and I'll I'll post this in the show notes as well. Just speaking of, it just reminded me, Doctor, our friend Doctor Kevin Vost has a book, Memorize the Faith, yep. and he has these great memorization tools. He was on the podcast a while back. I'm gonna put the link in the show notes there. Um, sorry, that just reminded me. I mean, if you can't even remember which uh, which. Uh, commandment comes one after the other yeah. in the Ten Commandments. I mean, yeah. We, it's we it's a good small. episode. It and it's something episode. that uh, <laughs> St. Thomas Aquinas uh, used as well. Um, mnemonic devices, um, just little techniques that you can use to better and more easily memorize things. Again, it's not really taught um, these days, like pagan link systems of memory and stuff like that, but they can be very powerful and very useful, so worth checking out. But that's, of course, a topic for another time. So, <laughs> so we just this is just kind of laying out this, the structure of section one. So why don't we just get into chapter one? I'll read this next part. And this is, of course, man's capacity for God. Okay, man's capacity for God, the desire for God, paragraph 27. The desire for God is written in the human heart because man is created by God and for God, and God never ceases to draw man to himself. Only in God will he find the truth and happiness he never stops searching for. And then the Catechism gives us a quote here. The dignity of man rests above all on the fact that he is called to communion with God. This invitation to converse with God is addressed to man as soon as he comes into being. For if man exists, it is because God has created him through love, and through love continues to hold him in existence. He cannot live fully according to truth unless he freely acknowledges that love and entrusts himself to his creator. And that is a quote from the Second Vatican Council. Hello, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure in, uh, shortly after this we'll get into um, uh, that different religious traditions around the world that they all point to this this truth. Yeah, well, let's keep going. Oh, so I'm going to okay. continue. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> This is informal. We know how it is. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm going to continue the quote here. In many ways throughout history, down to the present day, uh, men have given expression to their quest for God in their religious beliefs and behavior, in their prayers, sacrifices, rituals, meditations, and so forth. 
These forms of religious expression, despite the ambiguities they often bring with them, are so universal that one may call man a religious being. From one ancestor, God, made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. Though indeed he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. So as you can see, the catechism is constantly pulling in uh, both scripture and tradition. But I wanted to keep going because that is the point that that you were making. <laughs> That's good. I, I you know I didn't know that that it was like right <laughs> right after I read my catechism. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, for somebody who came from a new agey background, uh, to have this addressed in this way is was very noticeable to me because all the other times, you know, every little book I'd read, it said that. Um, you know, all the religions, it was, it was kind of the inverse of this. All the religions in the world pointed to an unknown truth. And here we're getting that God implanted this desire for us to know him. So we're constantly, you know, he's constantly calling to us and, and we are constantly, or hopefully responding to that call because we feel that inner pull. But it's not that the God is unknown, mm-hmm. that all the world's religions, you know, the, the, the ultimate truth is some, you know, secret knowledge that we're, we can't attain. Yeah. It, this is very different. It's it, a very it, different pr- picture. And so for coming from the perspective of uh, that's what I used to believe, this is so refreshing. Um, yeah, that's a really important point because the Catholic Church is is it's giving um, proper credence to other religious beliefs and customs. And, and the Catholic Church has never said that all of the religions are wrong all the way through, right? That they've got everything wrong. The Catholic Church just makes arguably an equally bold claim saying this is the fullness of God's revelation, that if you really want the closest and most intimate relationship with God, then you come into his church. This is what God has definitively revealed about himself, but it's acknowledging that um, God has implanted in himself um, on the hearts of all. And so it's, it's no surprise that throughout the entire world, throughout history, we see people groping for God. And that's exactly, and that is exactly what we do see, you know, the, that anthropologists have all recognized that that we are just an inherently religious species. Yeah, actually, some of the most interesting and uh, evidence that we are, I mean, comes back from who I mean, barely, <laughs> barely human. Uh, and then there are burial customs and, and things. You know, bones will be found buried with things because people understood they they wanted they, they had they had beliefs. The soul's upward yearning. Yeah. Uh, but to your other point, is it's true? You know, there's other um, religious traditions that make an interesting claim to say, well, 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 we can't know anything about God, and immediately the that sends a chill up my spine, uh, and I'll have to balk a little bit as a philosopher because to say that you can't know anything about God is to say at least you know one thing about God. <laughs> So we already got a little bit of a problem there, right? Yeah, we, so we can know something about God, right? Yeah. So we have we have problems with that claim. And the Catholic Church is saying, um, look, these other systems, these other beliefs, these other religions, um, there's, there's often a lot good there. There's often a lot true, but there's mixtures of ambiguities and error as well, oftentimes. Um, but this is what God has definitively revealed himself. And you will find the fullness of God's truth in the relationship that he wants with all of us in the Catholic Church. Uh, and I think that that's an important acknowledgement. You know, it's not that every other belief system, every other religion is, is wrong through and through. Uh, rather, the Catholic Church is saying, as we would expect with us being uh, religious spiritual creatures, that throughout history uh, and different you know, cultures and parts of the world, we will see different religious and spiritual expressions, which is exactly what we do see. Uh, so continuing on here, we are now in paragraph 29. But this intimate and vital bond of man to God can be forgotten, overlooked, or even explicitly rejected by man. Such attitudes can have different causes, revolt against evil in the world, religious ignorance or indifference, the cares and riches of this world, the scandal of bad example on part of believers, currents of thought hostile to religion, finally that attitude of sinful man which makes him hide from God out of fear and flee his call. That's uh, that's an Sums important up, paragraph, right? Yeah. right? So it's saying, look, God doesn't force us to seek him or have a relationship with him. 
And people can and do reject that invitation or even outright reject belief in God, which we've talked about many times. And the Catechism, I think, is very honest and and truthful about the different causes of atheism. Yes, people struggle with with evil and suffering. That's a big part of it. Um, Also, just religious ignorance or indifference. We've talked about that. I mean, to me, that's the hardest. When people are struggling kind of like very emotionally with a uh, with say the problem of suffering or something like that, they're almost always willing to have a conversation and engage, which is which is good. But when people are just very indifferent, that's that's difficult, and that's I think that is the biggest problem well, in our there, contemporary culture. Yeah. Well, even uh, in our own conversion, you were ahead of me in in desiring all of this stuff, and I remember several times you'd ask me, well, "What do you think about Jesus Christ or whatever? Or what do you think about Christianity?" I'm like, nah, "I'm good." Me. And I would just shut that conversation down because there's no. I got Monday night football. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, I'm good. No thanks. Hmm. Yeah, so if if you you can't even get a conversation off the ground, how are you going to do any evangelizing? Yeah, except through your own life, and maybe they'll see it eventually. Well, and that's funny because these things actually connect. So one of the you know the common themes of the answers to the problem of evil, as Aquinas will articulate, is that you know God will allow suffering and evil if and only if He can draw some outweighing benefit out of it primarily for the sufferer. So sometimes suffering and evil can can be used. I'm not saying this is the only or only reason, the only or always cause of suffering and evil, but it can be used to shake people out of indifference. And we see that all the time. Uh, but continuing on, uh, a few other points I want to highlight here is, again, very, I mean, the cares of the riches of the world, I think we're all familiar with that, right? That's a big issue, right? People just being materialists, not in the philosophical sense, but in the uh, greedy worldly sense. Yeah. Um, and here's, here's a huge one in our current time, the scandal of bad example on the part of the believers. Mm. So here's the church really kind of pointing at itself, you know, honestly saying, you know, look, we, we, you know, whatever else the causes of atheism are, we can't pretend like the scandal or the bad example of people who are believers isn't contributing to it. And that is something we all need to reflect on. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, rather, uh, uh, <laughs> whether, I'm trying to <laughs> combine whether and rather, uh, whether it is a large cr- church scandal or it's the uh, attitudes or uh, actions of everyday believers. I mean, I, <laughs> the caricature of uh, the Irishman drinking to oblivion on a Saturday night just or whatever. critical behavior. Yeah, and yeah. then, and then uh, y'all, I can just go to confession tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, if they even do that. <laughs> if they know, even I'll do that, yep. The Creasters, right? I will go to church on Christmas and Easter, and I'll behave like a hooligan the rest of the time, and, and I'll call myself Catholic. Get, yeah, that, for me, was, was a huge turnoff from religion for many years. So hippo- you know, forget the even more grotesque scandals. And again, it needs to be emphasized that abuse does not negate proper use. So once you understand what the Catholic Church is, scandal should never deter you from the Catholic Church, right? This is God's church. Ultimately, God is in control. Yes, it's a mystery why he allows bad things to happen, but that's a general mystery. That's not a mystery that's specific to the church, right? Yeah. So no matter what your religious commitments, you're going to have to answer for or, or think about why does God allow bad things to happen, right? You know, there's I can't remember what the quote is, but you're going to su- suffer with Jesus or without him, and I'd rather suffer with him. <laughs> It would just after all Where, those years of without Jesus. Mm-hmm. Now we're going through, say, 2020, which is a crazy year. Mm-hmm. Plus, any personal things that we've gone through over the past couple of years. Yeah. Uh, I there's no way that I would have been emotionally okay with any of this if I didn't have the bedrock of our faith. And it's, well, it's one of my favorite uh, scripture passages, you know, where Peter says very lovingly, you know, after uh, Christ has startled people away with the teachings on the Eucharist, you know, Lord, to whom else shall we go? <laughs> Like, this is this is it, right? Yeah. It's like <laughs> this is you know, and, and I feel exactly that way. Like nothing else seems even remotely close to being true to me. So when it comes to scandals and bad examples, yeah, we should be rightfully outraged and demand reform. But none of that impugns on the essential truths of the faith. What's the other? I got I got a, a couple of quips here. What, what's the other one? You don't live leave Jesus for the sins of Judah. Yeah, there's Judas. you got some good cliches for here. Lord Jesus yeah. for the sins of Judas. Yeah. Or the the hotel is a hospital for uh, sinners, not a hotel for saints. The, ch- the faith, the church is a, yeah, it's a hospital for sinners, not a hotel for saints. Even though there's many saints that have occupied it, and they need to be recognized as well. But the point is here is is you know oftentimes we look out in the culture and we want to attribute lack of belief or lack of faith or lack of just religious commitment um, just to just to sinfulness, right? 
And ultimately, I think it is sinfulness. But how often do we overlook that maybe it's it's our own sinfulness that's causing that lack of faith? Of people looking in? Of people looking in. And the church is rightfully acknowledging that. And I think that's an important challenge to take up. Um, And then, of course, you know, currents of thought hostile to religion. We see that in our culture enormously today. And just the attitude of sinful man, which made some high from God, uh, certainly have experienced that. So, continuing on, paragraph 30, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Although man can forget God or reject him, he never ceases to call every man to seek him so as to find life and happiness. But the search for God demands of man every effort of intellect, a sound will, an upright heart, as well as the witness of others who teach him to seek God. And then we have a quote here. I think this is from St. Augustine. You are great, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is your power, and your wisdom is without measure. And man, so small a part of your creation, wants to praise you. This man, though clothed with mortality and bearing the evidence of sin and the proof that you withstand the proud, despite everything man, though but a small part of your creation, wants to praise you, you yourself encourage him to delight in your praise. But you have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Yes, Augustine's famous quote from Confessions. Hard, yeah. hard not to be moved by that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I love. I, we read Confession. I, I partially read Confessions last fall, and how appropriate it is even for today. Mm-hmm. Just talking about Augustine real quick. I mean, everything he said and everything he was like, wow. It, when was this written? Yeah, was <laughs> this written five minutes ago? <laughs> yeah. Right, of just dealing with the temptations of for him, many sexual temptations were were huge and. Uh, he had a, a big intellectual conversion. He was always, uh, you know, always interested in the philosophical mm-hmm. questions. He he flirted with many of the the pagan beliefs, Manichae, Manichaeism, um, and eventually came to yeah, came to this profound sort of intellectual conversion on Catholicism and realized yeah, this this is true. But then struggled immensely with the with the deeper moral conversions. You know, his other f- favorite quote is "Lord, make me chaste, but not yet." <laughs> My other favorite quote of his, I yeah. say, Lord, make me chase, but not yet. <laughs> well, yeah, just such a great quote from a, the, a person who would understand this the best, mm-hmm. St. Augustine. St. Augustine. Um, good stuff. The catechism is fun, isn't it? <laughs> Ways of coming to know God. Okay, we're on paragraph 31. Created in God's image and called to know and love him, the person who seeks God discovers certain ways of coming to know him. There are also called proofs for the existence of God, not in a sense of proofs of the natural science, but rather in the sense of converging and convincing arguments, which allow us to attain certainty about the truth. These ways of approaching God from creation have a twofold point of departure, the physical world and the human person. The world, starting from movement, becoming, contingency, and the world's order and beauty, can, one can come to a knowledge of God as the origin and the end of the universe, as St. Paul says of the Gentiles. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. And as St. Augustine issues this challenge, question the beauty of the earth, question the beauty of the sea, question the beauty of the air, distending and diffusing itself, question the beauty of the sky, question all these realities, all respond, see, we are beautiful. Their beauty is a profession. These beauties are subject to change. Who made them, if not the beautiful one, who is not subject to change? I think that's such an interesting uh, point to bring out, is that um, it's not... So many of us stop at the creation. We worship the creation. We don't actually look beyond it and can even imagine that there could be something that would have created all of it mm. that and sustains it. Yeah, and th- what's what's I think also about the Catholic Church because this is, you know, speaking directly to my major interest in research area area in philosophy, which is philosophical arguments for God and the Catholic Church is affirming uh, that we can know God's existence apart from revelation. And it actually hints at some ways we can we can know it from from movement that would be like change. It's a hark- you know, harkening back to Aristotle and Aquinas becoming that's efficient causality efficient causality contingency which is the great question of well why does anything exist 
rather than nothing at all. Can, you know, a contingent thing is something that exists but doesn't have to exist or could be some other way. What is the ultimate explanation for this? So, so the church isn't here formally saying, here are the arguments that prove God's existence, but it is saying that we can have arguments that are converging and convincing uh, and that reason will itself converge on revelation. So the church is giving the, the sort of uh, the affirmation to the philosophical and rational grounds that point at, hint towards, or um, substantiate um, uh, Christianity. So as the Catechism affirms, we have this twofold point of departure. One is we can look at the, the world outside of us, again, through movement, becoming, contingency, um, order, teleology, whatever. Um, we can argue uh, for the existence of God from that, but also we have the inner path, which is the human person. So now we're on paragraph 33. With his openness to truth and beauty, his sense of moral goodness, his freedom and the voice of his conscience, with his longings f uh, for the infinite and for happiness, man questions himself about God's existence. In all this, he discerns signs of his spiritual soul. Soul, the soul, the seed of eternity we bear in ourselves, irreducible to the merely material, can have its origin only in God. So there we have that second point of departure where we can look at our conscience, the moral law, um, our ability to reason, right? This sort of Im these immaterial aspects of the human soul and also freedom of the will, our free will. <laughs> we have, if anyone hears the uh, toilet flushing, we have a, a toddler who just woke up. So, yeah, all these all these amazing and remarkable aspects of the human person. And I just want to mark out here something that I think is really important is that don't mistake um, what is common. Uh, don't think that because something is common that it's insignificant, right? Our experience of a moral law is extremely common. We all live our lives as if morality is is a real feature of the world, that it's objective. I mean, just, just look at the nature of political debates. People make moral accusations left and right. This is wrong. This is bad. This is evil. Uh, we all reason every single day. We, we all uh, act as if we really are substantially free creatures. So these are, I mean, some of the most basic... Um, commonplace aspects of experience, but none of them are insignificant. Um, and just the, what the church is saying is you reflect on this, you think deeply about this, all of these are going to point back to the to their ultimate source, which is God as well. So, hi, Isla, how are you? You want to say hi? Hi. Say hello louder. Say hello. Okay. Say hi really loud. Hi. There, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. We've got one quiet child. This is it. Mm -hmm. mm, pretty quiet. Yeah, you're quiet. You're sneaky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a nice podcast guest. So should we keep going, or do you have any other thoughts on that? No, go ahead. Okay, paragraph 34. The world and man attest that they contain within themselves neither their first principle nor their final end, but rather that they participate in being itself, which alone is without origin or end. Thus, in different ways, man can come to know that there exists a reality which is the first cause and final end of all things, a reality that everyone calls God. And they're quoting St. Thomas there. Man's, uh, you know, and that's that's the idea of this idea of participation, metaphysics, right? That they, that only God is his own nature, that God is uh, subsistent existence itself. And that all of us, we exist, but we don't exist in virtue of what we are. We sort of borrow or derive existence. We participate in this causal property, which is essential to God, which God being pure existence itself. So God not only brings us into being, but he sort of, He donates being to us for as long as we exist. It's not like God just flicked the first domino. And we already heard the, uh, the scripture quote that, you know, in him we live and move and have our being, that God sustains us in being, sustains us by love at every moment that we exist. So God's causality is, is often far more radical than, than people Think. So that that means that God didn't just create us and bounce, right? He's not some kind in of peace. Yeah, <laughs> to more seemly recreations. Yeah, right, right. He's not some kind of delinquent dad, is what you're saying. Yeah, no deadbeat dad, God here. Yeah, so it's not deism, right? And, yeah. and good philosophical reflection on on the sort of nature and causal relation that God has to the world shows that the, we only exist. If God stopped thinking about us for a second, poof, we would be gone. That isn't an indifferent God. 
right? This is a God that at every moment we exist is, again, donating existence to us, holding us in being. So this is a God that, apart from all the miracles he's ever uh, staged, which Catholics would affirm are quite a good number, uh, is, is again, uh, is intimately involved in creation as you could possibly get because he is at every second maintaining it in existence. Uh, so yeah, deism is out. Um, so yeah, deism is, is the sort of... Um, I was never attracted to the idea that, yeah, that there is a God, there's a creator, he kind of flicked everything in motion, but, you know, he had more seemly recreations to attend to, he got sick of our family bickering, etc. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yes, we can affirm some some ultimate principle of things, but he's probably not that interested in us. The Catholic faith rightfully and firmly rejects that it's view like of that, God. That was, I, and my brother believed in that for a bit, as far as I know, and that was a stepping stone for me to get away from any type of faith, so... It's like, I, I don't think it's that uncommon. No, it's it's a politically, you know, like people argue that Thomas Jefferson was something of a deist or that many of the founding fathers were, and that's not entirely accurate. There were many more theists and Christians than there were deists at the founding of our country, but they're certainly, certainly borrowing the great moral principles from the Catholic tradition at the founding of our country, such as all men being made in the image and likeness of God, all of us having certain inalienable rights. You don't get that from atheism. You get that from Christianity. Now, deism is, is I, I really just call it like a politically convenient Christianity because you can kind of have like, and I don't think it's sustainable, but you have like just enough transcendence that maybe you can get some foothold on something like uh, ontological uh, equality between humans, that we all come from the same source or creator so we can have a basis for equal rights. However, while trying to just shave off everything else that typically comes with God's existence, mm -hmm. which is a very robust moral law. Right. Uh, you know, uh, of course, we would also argue uh, the Catholic faith, religion. So if you're trying to establish like a secular society but not collapse into nihilism, you could see how deism might be an attractive option. The only problem is that it's false. <laughs> so um, so now we're on to the section three. I don't know if you wanted to pause there and... Um, Maybe just offer some final thoughts. And, yeah, yeah, you know. let's do that. Yeah, so what do you got? You go first. Um, <laughs> I mean, I love this section of the catechism because it's just, it's. I mean, how does this not speak directly to the heart that, that all, all of us, all of us are made by God for God. All of us have a rational, unique individual soul that cries out for God and that we are free. We are free to pursue God and, we, and this is what we were made for and this is what we should do. And that faith and reason go hand in hand, that faith, as we'll see as we move forward here, is man's proper response to God. But everything about God, um, well, maybe not everything, but enough about God can be known philosophically and through reason that we have this sufficient warrant and justification to pursue uh, religion, to really seek God, and to try and find this, this ultimate and proper end. Uh, of what it means to be human. And I just love that this is how the catechism starts. Uh, and I think it just uh, is, is very, is, is just very true. All of this is, is absolutely right. So, yeah, I, I want just yes to everything you just said. And also add, and I said it a little bit before, is. Uh, okay. Well, now <laughs> yeah. she's getting talkative. Uh, hold on one second. <laughs> uh, is we as humans tend to stop at a certain level of what we think God could be or who created the universe. And even just in these first few paragraphs of the catechism, and we'll get into it more about how uh, powerful and loving God is and omniscient and all, all those, you know, whatever the, he's all, the, 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 all the omni attributes. <laughs> yes, yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. The omni attributes. Thank you. Um, th they just are beyond what are they're They're so far beyond of what the average human would come up with. Mm -hmm. And I, it, you hinted at it, we, we hint at it here in the first couple of paragraphs of the catechism, and um, I, I just think that's so so important that we just we we're so not creative <laughs> sometimes, and we're so limited. And even in just a couple paragraphs, the catechism starts opening the door for how magnificent God is and how much He loves us. And I, I just I love that. We are using the JP two catechism. Um, it's on Amazon, I think, for like. 10 bucks. It's yeah, got, if that. It's got a ton of great reviews, which is always funny <laughs> to see on Amazon. Five stars. Excellent book. <laughs> um, 
So gra- grab it and follow along. And I guess if people enjoy this series, they can let us know on through email or Instagram, and maybe we'll make it a more regular thing because I've always been deeply enriched by going through the catechism. So I just wanted to share that with yeah. people. Awesome. Okay. Well, and, and always, you know, if you want to make sure you don't miss any of these episodes, hit subscribe. If you hit, hit subscribe, please leave a nice review so other people can find the Catholic Mama or Pat, your show if you're airing it on yours, the Pat Flynn Show. And then Isla, would you like to say see you next time? See you next time. <laughs> Bye. See you next time. <laughs>